greatest adventure is what lies ahead today and tomorrow are yet to be said hello everyone this is no one of consequence back with the third episode in my series of videos that will recount my ongoing Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Uh, if you haven't yet, you might want to go back and watch the first two episodes before you watch this one, so that that way you'll have a better idea of what's going on. As before, let me just start by giving a spoiler alert. Uh, details about this particular adventure module, the Village of Hamlet, will be revealed in this video, so just keep that in mind as uh, if you watch. So last time I uh, talked about how the player characters are traveling from the village of Valarial, which is on the far left-hand side of this map, and they would be traveling to the village of Hamlet, which is on the center right side of this map. Um, I measured the road distance just to see how long or how far it would be. And I came up with a figure of about 250 miles. So, of course, it would take the characters several days, a couple of weeks, to travel this distance. I should point out that when the characters reach the village of Lawrence Ford, which I've highlighted with this arrow on the map, the uh, player character Rory the Halfling left the party and decided to go back north to his home in the village of Littleboro. So he left the party, and the rest of them continued east along the road towards the village of Hamlet. So what that means, then, is that the player character party now consists of six player characters, which I've shown here. And I've also shown which characters are run by which player. So the, uh, the bottom line is we've got six current player characters being run by four different actual players. Now, in addition to the player characters, there's uh, several NPCs that are associated with the party as well. Um, starting off, we have Quan, who is working as an animal handler and wagon driver. And if you remember in the first video, Quan was rescued from some hobgoblins. And uh, he's decided to stay on with the uh, player characters and work for them. And then also, uh, before they left the village of Valarial, they hired another animal handler slash wagon driver, uh, Jasmine, to uh, assist in those duties. And then, the last video, I introduced the four animal NPCs that the uh, characters currently have, and you can see those here. So, when the characters arrived at the village of Hamlet, of course, the first thing they did was uh, look for lodgings for the uh, for their stay here and the the inn of the welcome wench is a prominent building so they quickly found it uh, got inside got rooms reserved and uh, settled in to have some food um, it didn't take long before one of the locals, introduce himself to the characters. Uh, his name is Elmo, and uh, he uh, seems like a friendly, jovial person, but also somewhat of the, perhaps a village drunkard. Um, but he was, uh, he was not unpleasant company, and he also mentioned the fact that uh, his father is the uh, captain of the village militia, so uh, he was proud of that. So he hung around with the party on this first evening. So the next day, the uh, characters decided to go around the village and uh, try to introduce themselves and talk to people. Because if you recall from the last video, they had 
got papers from an evil wizard that indicated that there was uh, some problems stirring in, in this area. And so they were looking for someone of authority that they could talk to to relay that information. And they asked if there was a mayor similar to what was in the uh, previous village. And they found out that here in Hamlet, there's a village elder. And so they went to that person's home and it turned out to be a gated walled in farmyard and so they you know knocked at the gate and then finally a worker came to uh, see who it was and they explained that they wanted to talk to the village elder and this uh, the the farmhand here said well you know he's busy he uh, he's got important stuff to do and he basically said, quite frankly, if the uh, village elder made time for every random stranger that came through, then that's all he would do. So uh, he essentially told the characters to, you know, be on your way. The, the village elder doesn't have time for you. And uh, nearby, there was a stone tower had been constructed and obviously that was an important looking building so the characters went there and called up to a guard in the tower um, watching the drawbridge and kind of the same thing that character said that they needed to talk to somebody in charge because they had some important information and again the guard said, well, my uh, my employers here, Rufus and Byrne, are uh, busy men and don't have time to entertain random strangers who just suddenly turn up at the door. And unless you've been invited, that uh, you're probably not going to get a chance to see them. So, sorry. So... All of these things were, you know, it, it was disappointing to the characters, and, and they can be forgiven for that because, you know, the village that they had just come from, Valerial, by the time that whole series of adventures is over, the villagers there treated the characters as conquering heroes, and deservedly so. You know, they had uh, done a lot for the villagers. And were justifiably treated as heroes. And then they come here and I think maybe they sort of expect the same kind of treatment. But as I mentioned earlier, it's 250 miles. Nobody here knows who they are. Uh, the, The module describes this whole village as a busy crossroads. People are passing through all the time. And so just another band of random adventures is no big deal. And so the characters didn't really get anywhere along those lines. So on their way back to the inn, they uh, saw the village blacksmith at work and decided to talk with him, see what you know goods he might have for sale, what services he offered. And uh, he introduced himself as Brother Smythe. And he uh, said the reason he calls himself Brother Smythe is because he's a disciple of the local druid. And um, when the characters asked him about what goods and services he provides, he said that he pretty much limits himself to making farm implements, hand tools, that sort of thing that would be useful in a small agricultural village like this. And uh, But as far as uh, weapons and armor, that sort of thing, he said he really didn't have the skill to make those. Uh, He said he could probably repair those sorts of things if the characters were to need it, but making them from scratch was pretty much beyond his ability. And then in asking about 
uh, being a druid, he said that he was interested in the old faith, the druidic faith, but just by the very fact that he's a blacksmith and works with metal probably meant that he would never rise very high in the druidic uh, hierarchy. And so, at the, uh, upon him saying that, Gorbodok the halfling there proceeded to insult him by saying, so basically you're telling us you suck at both your jobs. And so that didn't go over very well. So not only were they were the characters snubbed by the power brokers within the village, but then they turn around and insult one of the most important villagers, the uh, the local blacksmith. So after spending this first day in the village, either being insulted by or insulting the locals, the uh, characters went back to the inn, and not long after they got there, a new person introduced himself, uh, saying uh, his name was Spugnor. And uh, he said he was a magic user, and if the player characters were interested, then he might have a proposition for them. So, uh, going back to the player characters table, uh, Spugnor introduced himself to everyone else as a magic user who was... uh, here uh, to follow up on some rumors he had been told he explained to them that he knew that there was ruins of a moat house not too many miles away out in the swamps that had once been occupied by uh, evil creatures including spellcasters and so he was interested in exploring that, but he didn't feel like he could go there safely by himself. So he was looking for some extra help to go along, and he decided the player characters looked like they would fit the bill. Um, Meanwhile, the characters thought that since they couldn't get anybody to listen to them so far, that Maybe if they went to this place, they could uncover some new information regarding uh, things that are going on here. And uh, that might help convince the locals that there's trouble afoot. Uh, Spugnor offered to take them to this place tomorrow, in fact. Uh, his He only asked for one thing, and that was to be given first dibs on any magic user scrolls that might be found and the reason for that is because you know he himself is a magic user and he's always looking to expand his you know repertoire of spells and so as long as uh, he was given first dibs on any magic scrolls found as far as he was concerned, the rest the characters could have any other treasure that they might come across. So uh, that deal sounded good to everyone else, but Thoral the Mage, the you know the party's magic user, didn't really care for those terms because, being a magic user himself, he too is trying to collect spells, and. Um, Yeah, so, although he didn't like the deal, he was heavily outvoted by the other characters, and so he really had no choice but to go along with it. So, moving forward to the next day, the uh, characters set out, along with Spug Noir, towards this ruined moat house in the swamps. And they arrived and tried to get in and were immediately attacked 
by a bunch of giant frogs that were living in the the swampy moat that surrounded the moat house. So this uh, screenshot here shows everything that's going on once the battle is well underway. You can see the characters amongst the frogs and then down to the lower left. You can see their horses and other animals that they had brought along as well. But uh, let's try to unpack what's going on here. So I had made this uh, detailed slide from my players way back when, labeling everything that's going on. So if we start down here at the bottom and go clockwise, you can see that the halfling, Gorbodok the halfling, had been fighting one of these smaller frogs and had managed to defeat it. Then um, Garrett the thief, same thing, fighting a frog. Up to the uh, left-hand side, you see that the dwarf, uh, Obrek the dwarf, had actually been swallowed by one of the frogs. But uh, Aramis, the fighter, had managed to kill the frog and help Obrek cut himself out before he died. Uh, just above them, you can see a semi-transparent... Uh, Duke the cleric, he had been swallowed by a frog as well, and unless he got help right away, he was in danger of dying. Uh, continuing on clockwise, you can see where a spug noir has been pinned down by a giant frog and is in the process of being swallowed. And then finally, uh, Thoral the mage there had tried to cast magic missile on one of their frogs, but it had attacked him first and hit him and uh, thereby disrupted his spell. So after some more rounds of combat, the characters finally managed to defeat the frogs and uh, rescue everybody who had either been swallowed or was in danger of being swallowed. And then from that point, they were able to continue on into the moat house. Uh, at one point, while they were exploring the upper levels of the moat house, they, the characters split up into two separate groups. And that's what you see here, down here in the lower left-hand corner. You see a group of the characters that have just fought and defeated a giant lizard that was hidden amongst the ruins. And then on the upper right-hand corner, some of the other characters have uh, are in the process of fighting a giant tick that was hiding in the fireplace, which you can see there in the room. And if you look at Duke there, his hit points have gotten pretty low, and the reason is because the uh, tick, if it latches onto you, it starts draining your blood. And so uh, Duke was having a hard time with it, but the other characters were able to save him. They had some other encounters up here on the upper levels. I don't have screenshots. One important point, uh, this... A large room in the upper levels, the characters found it and saw that it had obviously recently been occupied as a camp by somebody. There were still bedrolls lying about. There were the remains of a, a fire in the fireplace. The coals were still smoking, but nobody was here. Um, in exploring about and trying to figure out where the people who had been here had gone in such a hurry, the characters found a secret door on the eastern wall, and you can see where it's marked. And the secret door led to a flight of stairs going down deeper beneath the moat house. Now, the characters had found another stairwell that was not hidden. It led off that hallway from the previous screen, but... They had also found this secondary secret stairwell going down, 
And so they speculated that whoever would, had been up here in this room might have used it to go deeper down into the ruins of the moat house. Uh, one thing that characters decided not to tell Spug Noir about this secret stairwell. The, uh, as you saw earlier, the characters were in different parts. They had split up into different groups. And Spug Noir was not here when this secret stairwell was discovered. And so the characters who were there agreed to keep it amongst themselves to not and not tell Spug Noir about this secret stairwell. So the uh, characters returned back to the village for the night, stayed in their rooms with the plan to return to the moat house the following morning. However, um, Thoral, the magic user, as I mentioned, he, he sort of saw Spugnor as a rival because Spugnor was wanting magic user scrolls for himself and Thoral being a magic user as well. Trying to expand his repertoire would certainly want scrolls too. So Thoral took it upon himself to get up early and go to the room at the end that he knew Spug Noir was staying in, and he cast a wizard lock on the door so that uh, that way uh, Spug Noir would not be able to meet out front later that morning and travel with the characters back to the moat house. So, um... The characters did go back to the moat house uh, without Spug Noir because he didn't show up on time. And they had uh, various encounters on the lower level, which I do not have any screenshots for. Um, one significant encounter, the characters encountered an ogre and were able to defeat him and... Then in an, in an adjacent room, the ogre had some uh, prisoners that he was saving f to eat at his convenience, which the characters freed the prisoners. Uh, one of them was a gnome, and the gnome, in exchange for his freedom, uh, gave to Obrak... Felt being a gnome, he felt a kinship to Obrak the dwarf. Uh, he gave him a plain iron ring, which he said was a ring of uh, gnome friendship, and that if Obrak should ever encounter any gnomes in the future, that they would recognize that ring as a sign of friendship. And they would be m more likely to help Obrek with uh, any th problems that he had uh, since he had been named a friend of the gnomes. So a, uh, another thing that went on during the day was, uh, while the characters were at the moat house, uh, Spugnar couldn't get out of his room at the end because Thoral had wizard locked it. And the uh, owner of the inn and other people tried various ways to break down the door to uh, get Spugnar out. And then finally they concluded it was uh, magic that was keeping it shut. And so they sent to the tower for... Uh, burn the magic user who was one of the two lords of the tower and uh, burn came to the inn and decided that yes the door was magically locked but he was of sufficient level that he could override the magic which he did and managed to uh, allow spug noir to finally get out of his room, but not before uh, some damage had been inflicted on the door to his room. 
uh, in attempts to get him out of there. Right, so when the uh, characters got back to town, there was several people waiting for them after all the hullabaloo about uh, Spugnor being locked in his room, uh, including Burn, the magic user who lived in the tower. Uh, you know, the day before, the characters had tried to gain admittance to the tower, and the guard out front pretty much blew them off. But now the characters had gotten their attention, and Burn and his friend Rufus, the fighter, wanted to talk to these people and, and try to find out just exactly who they are and why they're here. And so when the characters returned to the end that at the end of that day, they were invited to dinner at Rufus and Burns Tower, where they could talk in private and Rufus and Burn could get a better idea of just why exactly the characters were here in town and what they were doing here. The uh, characters decided that they would not all go to this dinner invitation because at this point, you know, they're still new here. They don't know what to expect. For all they know, it could be a trap. So they decided to send just two characters to dinner, uh, those being Duke, the priest, and Gorbodok, the halfling. And then, meanwhile, back at the end, uh, Thoral especially was preoccupied because the innkeeper immediately presented him with a bill to pay for the damages that had been done to Spugnor's uh, room while uh, they were trying to figure out how to break him out of his room. So Spugnor was back at the inn, or I'm sorry, uh, Thor was back at the inn settling that debt, and the other characters were there as well, while uh, Gorb and um, do came to this dinner invitation. So uh, Rufus and Burn explained to the characters that the reason they were here is that they had participated in defending the land against a previous outbreak of evil about ten years prior. And as a reward... For their service, the Viscount of Verbabonk had awarded them this land and given them permission to build a tower here so that they might uh, be able to continue to keep an eye on the area and hopefully get wind if uh, evil started stirring once again. And so... They uh, just asked the characters, uh, one, try not to cause trouble in the village or cause vandalism, and two, that if they were to under uncover any new signs of, of actual evil beyond just mere highway robbery, that if they would please report back to them, Rufus and Byrne, and uh, let them know what the characters had found out. So the next day, with uh, Spug Noir's feeling smoothed over, uh, he rejoined the party, and they all went back to the moat house down to the lower level to finish exploring that, and the characters quickly found themselves fighting with a group of gnolls that were defending a chamber. And this is a screenshot that I had taken and then labeled when I posted it uh, for my players to review. And so I still have the labels here. Uh, you can see up front, Obrak and Aramis, the two fighter types, are rushing in to engage with these gnolls in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, behind them you have Duke, the cleric, who's reading spells in case he needs to heal anyone. 
Uh, Garrett the Thief back there is using missile weapons or is able to use missile weapons. Uh, Thoral the Magic user has uh, cast shield on himself because the Nulls had started off firing missile weapons. Uh, Spugnor, as usual, is in the rear. And Gorbadoc the Halfling, uh, he was originally up front, but took several arrows from the Nulls when the party first encountered them. And so he has fallen back around the corner to uh, try to keep himself from being outright killed. So on this next slide, uh, the characters have fought their way through that main chamber. They have killed all the, the gnolls that were fighting. And they've moved over into the side chamber. Um, there are a couple of gnolls still alive, but they have fallen back into the corner of this room to try to save their lives. The dwarf, Obrak, was able to communicate with them, and the characters promised to spare the Null's lives if they would give them information about what's going on down here. The, the main thing that the Nulls were able to relate is that uh, all of them down here were hired and brought here by an evil cleric and his minions, who lives in a series of chambers nearby. And uh, the Nulls were feeling disgruntled because they had been here longer but the evil cleric had recently hired a band of bugbears to expand his forces. And even though they were newer, the bugbears were getting preferential treatment. And the gnolls felt slighted by that. And so these two were willing to tell what they knew about the evil cleric in exchange for their lives. And so that's what the characters did. They agreed to just let the gnolls go as long as they promised to leave the area uh, in exchange for what they could tell the party about this evil cleric. So continuing on, the player characters found themselves entering this uh, catacombs area. There were a lot of uh, scattered bones lying about, old broken coffins and so forth. So they continued further inside, and it wasn't long before they were attacked by ghouls. They're at the back of a burial chamber. The wall was knocked out, and then tunnels were dug into the earth. And some ghouls came rushing out of there and uh, attacked Duke the Cleric. And you can see here in this screenshot, uh, he's been paralyzed. The uh, uh, touch of ghouls can paralyze if you fail your saving throw. And that's what's happened here. And you see Gorbadoc the halfling of Rudd running in to help, and then behind him, you see Garrett the thief. Uh, unfortunately, the rest of the characters were, at least for the time being, unable to help with Duke because there were other ghouls out in the main catacombs area that they were dealing with. And so up here you see Aramis, O'Brack, uh, Thoral and Spug Noir fighting their own sets of ghouls. Uh, further into the ghoul tunnels, you can see that, again, uh, Duke has been paralyzed, and the ghoul that had done so actually dragged his body deeper into the tunnels into an area where the ghouls had their nest which is where they keep their treasure and also where they feed. 
And so this ghoul had dragged the paralyzed uh, Duke back into the nest while the other ghoul uh, blocked the entrance and was fighting with Gorbodok to try to keep him from gaining entrance to that area. Uh, Gorbodok was eventually able to defeat that ghoul along with uh, Garrett. You can He's in the shadows, but you can see Garrett at the top of this screenshot. And uh, th- so they approached the ghoul nest area just in time because this ghoul was in the process of peeling off Duke's armor so that he could get to the flesh underneath and start feeding. So they got there just in time, and by uh, not long after that, the rest of the party was able to come in as well. And so they defeated that ghoul in the ghoul's nest. And then you have another straggler ghoul uh, coming into the tunnel uh, to fight the characters. But now that the party was reunited, they were able to stop that ghoul fairly easily. Continuing on, the characters walked down this one tunnel, which opened up into a, a... a uh, natural cavernous room that had a large pool of water inside it. And uh, upon getting a bit closer and exploring that, this giant crayfish swam up from the depths and leapt out of the water and uh, began attacking the characters. Uh, my memory is, you know, this is one of those fights where. I thought it would be more of a challenge, and it actually turned out to be it. My memory is that they were the characters were able to dispatch this giant crayfish fairly quickly. So uh, it was it was kind of disappointing. It, w- it was not as a knockdown, drag out fight as I I thought it would be. So at any rate, the characters finished this encounter and then decided that they would go back to uh, the village of Hamlet for the night so that they could rest and recuperate and come back the next day and hopefully find and deal with this evil cleric that the Knowles had told them about. So the characters got back to the inn for the night, sitting around having dinner and um rory the halfling turned up and he came with some news uh he he said that a messenger from valerial had found him to deliver some new information you know uh <clears throat> as i said earlier rory lived at that village of littleborough and so when Valerial sent a messenger out this way looking for the characters and so the messenger would be dropping names asking if anybody knew who they were and the only name that he got a hit on was Littleborough uh well Rory I mean um people started saying oh yeah I know the Rory I know Rory I know his uh, clan name Hearthfoot they live in Littleborough so the messenger was directed there he found Rory delivered the message and then Rory decided that it was important enough that he should come to Hamlet because he knew that's where the characters were going and uh, deliver this message in person Uh, the message being from Valeriel that Several days after the characters left, uh, during the night, the village was attacked. Once again, only this time, they only focused on the sheriff's office and where the jail cells were. And uh, it was a the only description they got were these large, hairy creatures with immense strength. And they used uh, hammers to cave in the wall of a uh, the cell where Istan was being held prisoner awaiting a new trial 
And these creatures were able to, because they were so big and strong, they were able to quickly break through the stone walls of the cell and pull Istan out and carry him off in the darkness again. So the message that Rory brought to the rest of the characters was simply that Istan had been freed once again and was out uh, somewhere and that the character should be careful because they could easily run into Istan again out here where they are now. So uh, that was Rory's message. Okay, so that's all I have for now. Uh, thanks once again for watching. I really do appreciate it. And if you haven't yet, uh, you might consider subscribing to my channel. So if, uh, if you found this interesting, then you'll be notified when new episodes are uploaded. Thanks, for, thanks again for watching. I appreciate it.